Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are in this world. <laughs> Welcome to this week's edition of It's Worth a Shot, hosted by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. My name is Jesse Kinsey, and I'm an account manager uh, coming to you from the big sky state of Montana. Today is June 21st, 2023, and today's topic we are hosting a special guest speaker from the beautiful state of Hawaii uh, that will be discussing malnutrition and sepsis. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Next slide, please. A few updates and reminders. Um, I guess one big major update and reminder, uh, we will be pausing our July 5th session of It's Worth a Shot. Uh, and we'll be resuming July 12th. So uh, just a reminder, July 5th, we'll be taking a little bit of a break. Next slide, please. As always, if you housekeeping items, feel free to add your webinar top webinar topics or clinician ideas into chat. There'll also be a post presentation evaluation that we will insert in chat. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We look at those every week and gather topic ideas and um, take in consideration the feedback. And you can free type in the end of that post evaluation any uh, topic ideas or uh, webinar offerings that you're interested in. And we do have a polling question for this week. Do you have access to your state immunization information system to look up resident vaccination status? We have come a long ways in the nursing home world as far as our state IIS system access. It historically had been underutilized and is such an asset to be able to look up those records versus waiting on paper trails. So it's great to see most now have access, but there's still some that don't. If you do not and you're interested, please reach out to me. I will put my email in chat and I can give you the enrollment um, contact information for your state so that you can sign up for the service. It's free service um, and we can uh, pass that information on. Trust me, it'll make your life easier when you're trying to reconcile vaccine records. All right, Mary, we can go ahead and close that poll. Thank you guys, as always, for participating. There we go. All right, next slide, please. Taking a quick look at our weekly COVID-19 snapshot. Uh, great news. Uh, continues. Uh, hospitalizations continue to be on the decline. Deaths are on the decline. And those um, vaccination rates, they're still holding steady um, uh, as we continue to encourage folks to be up to date with their vaccinations. Um, of note, all vaccinations vaccinated groups have overall lower risk of dying from COVID-19 and for testing positive for COVID-19 as compared to people who were unvaccinated. And I'm gonna drop a link in the chat box for you guys right now. I know that there had been a lot of interest early on in what does that data look like? And I don't know if that link works, so if it doesn't, I'll put it in. Um, in a little bit, but um, there had been a lot of interest uh, as far as what does uh, the COVID-19 cases and deaths by vaccination status look like? What is that data looking like for those that are um, becoming uh, hospitalized or um, experiencing significant illness for those vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations? And we just hadn't had uh, a whole lot of data coming our way, and we are starting to see some greater analysis um, of those um, that data. So again, I'll, if that link didn't work that I put in chat, I'll, I'll try it again. But sharing that information forward as we look at the significance of being vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And next slide, please. Um, and just a quick peek at our COVID-19 hospital admission levels. Um, you know, we had seen a, um, 
a little bit of yellow cropping up in Nebraska and Wyoming and Nevada and parts of Texas. Um, but overall, um, our hospital admission levels do remain low. Um, and uh, also a significant comment to, to make as far as reporting, COVID-19 hospitalization data will not be updated this week. Um, and that is gonna be due to a change in that reporting cadence from daily to weekly. Again, that's that hospitalization data. So um, stay tuned as the updates uh, will populate again on June 26th. So just a FYI there for you guys. All right, next slide, please. So we do have a follow-up and an update to last week's questions and answers. Uh, the question that we had approached and addressed last week, will there be a COVID-19 monovalent vaccine in the future? Well, there's a little bit of a pivot. Um, uh, up until the conversation that was hosted on June 15th, there had been no mention of returning to a monovalent uh, formulation. However, um, there was an update from that FDA meeting from the Vaccines and Related um, Biological Products uh, Advisory Committee uh, for, for long, um, the meeting hosted on June 15th, and they discussed that they will make recommendations now to look at a, monova a monovalent vaccine targeting that XBB lineage, specifically that formulation for the fall and uh, winter of this upcoming year. So I'll throw that link in the chat too if you wanna look uh, in greater detail to the recording slides and some notes that are available from that June 15th meeting. But again, an update to that question, um, Sounds like they are looking at a monovalent vaccine now. So um, no surprise, you know, we've always pivoted and, and things change. So uh, just sharing that forward with the audience. And also that advisory, the ACEP meeting, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, um, they will be discussing this further uh, actually this week on June 23rd. So stay tuned for what comes out of that meeting. And we will uh, definitely be sure to share forward information as we are made aware as well. And next slide, please. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jolene in Hawaii, that will be introducing our special guest today that's discussing maximizing nutritional status to improve outcomes related to sepsis. Jolene. Oh, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, good afternoon and good morning. Aloha from Honolulu. Um, Jolene Kageyama, account manager for Mountain Pacific. And I am very pleased and honored to introduce um, Darcy Ho, registered dietitian here in the state of Hawaii, licensed here in the state of Hawaii. I've known Darcy since 2007. Um, she was a student at our community. Um, uh, working uh, with us part-time through the university. And um, she has been an amazing um, person to work with as our registered dietitian um, in the past, you know, uh, since 2007. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you, Darcy, and um, take it away. Okay, hi, good morning. Um, so I'm Darcy. I'm coming to you from here from Honolulu, Hawaii, and I'm so honored to be here this morning. Um, I was invited to talk to you all about uh, malnutrition and more specifically and how we can support our residents um, to prevent um, and reduce the prevalence of sepsis. Um, so I've been practicing since 2007. Um, I also have um, my board certification in gerontological nutrition. Um, I've worked um, in the healthcare setting yeah, since 2007. I've worked as a cook, dietary aide, uh, worked in multiple kitchens. And so I'm very passionate about food and, and getting our residents to eat. Um, you know, sepsis and malnutrition go hand in hand. And so in my line of work, I really aim to increase um, our residents' nutritional status to improve their outcomes, um, not just with any acute illnesses and infections, but for their overall health. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And so oftentimes um, we have residents that come in, you know, we see malnutrition either before 
hospitalization during or even after any acute issues. Um, there was some concern about having a prevalence, an increase of prevalence of residents coming in from long-term care with a diagnosis of sepsis, along with a secondary diagnosis of malnutrition, um, especially for our older adults. Um, there are several risk factors that can increase a person's risk for sepsis. Um, just a few examples, again, age, those who are 65 and older, which is our primary focus population we're working with. Um, anyone who is immunocompromised um, with, you know, diagnosis of HIV or AIDS. We have um, cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. Um, anyone who's had organ transplants and taking medications or immunosuppressive drugs. Um, other risk factors for sepsis is anything that can create an infection, such as any openings to the bodies where that, that be IVs. Um, catheters, vents, or even development of wounds that can easily progress into a septic scenario. Um, chronic conditions that contribute to inflammation can also increase those risks, such as diabetes, um, and kidney disease, um, lung, heart disease, and also an overuse of antibiotics, just to name a few. So complications from sepsis, of course, we are of shock, um, which can lead to organ dysfunction, and you know it can be fatal. So it's definitely something we want to address and look into. Next slide, please. Um, when discussing malnutrition in our healthcare setting, we'll either hear about protein energy or protein calorie malnutrition, and quite simply, malnutrition is an imbalance of our nutritional intake. Um, oftentimes, we like to think of malnutrition as undernutrition, uh, but malnutrition can also occur with those with experiencing obesity. So there is a paradox of being obese and experiencing malnutrition as well due to the lack of quality of diet or any acute issues they might have. So it's something that we also need to be attentive to and not just putting off anyone who may be in the obese or overweight category and assuming that they are not malnourished. So malnutrition can, um, not just with your macronutrients, like your protein, carbon, and fats, but can also occur with micronutrients such as your vitamins and minerals. Um, and there's just different ways to assess malnutrition. We'll discuss that a little bit more and there can be different severity, levels of severity to it. Uh, next slide. Okay. So in nutrition and immune um, function, uh, malnutrition, so of course, malnutrition can lead to immune dysfunction and we need to have a varied diet to meet all of our nutritional needs. Um, there are several healthy eating patterns that can support this. Uh, mostly in the news, we've been hearing more about plant-based diets. So plant-based diets aren't necessarily vegan or vegetarian, but having a majority of your food come from plants. Um, a popular one that's often um, supported is the Mediterranean diet. It includes a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes and lean proteins like our fish and poultry, and it also use, utilizes healthy fats. So this diet, you know, usually supports heart health. It can help reduce the risk of some cancers and improve the management of diabetes and weight control. Um, I always like to tell people to eat a rainbow, and the idea is to provide, provide a variety of different foods to meet our recommended daily intake. Um, typically, fruits and vegetables, um, from different colors have uh, usually represent a high amount of a certain nutrient or phytochemical. So for example, your reds, which are like your tomatoes and watermelons can be high in lycopene, um, orange and yellow fruits and vegetables like citruses and carrots, um, higher in vitamin C and carotenoids, and our dark leafy greens are high in folate. Um, oftentimes I find residents or people getting stuck on eating a superfood because they hear that it's high in a certain nutrient. And so they just incorporate it into their diet every day and eat a lot of it, but that won't necessarily meet all their dietary needs. There's no one food item that can meet all of our needs. Um, with that, we also wanna avoid any ultra processed foods because um, it can contribute to inflammation, which is not good for immune health. Um, ultra processed foods are usually low in nutrients um, and high in salt, sugar, and fats. Um, they, they are highly altered and they contain very little of the whole food that it started with. So examples would be like sweet chips, um, packaged snacks or cookies. And it includes beverages too, not just foods, such like, like sodas. 
And to improve our immune health, it's also important to support our gut microbiome. So we always have this good bacteria living in us and it plays an integral role. Um, and to support that bacteria in our body and that our gut microbiome, it's important to include foods every day that are nourishing to it, um, usually prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are foods that are beneficial for the bacteria. It's usually high in fiber. Um, so fiber-rich foods like legumes and whole grains are prebiotics. Probiotics contain live organisms. So things like yogurt, kefir, um, fermented foods that ha haven't been pasteurized like kimchi or sauerkraut. Um, and often I've, I've been seeing more physicians, they're more aware of the importance of the gut microbiome and how um, it can support our immune health. And with the use of antibiotics, I'm seeing more physicians pair um, when they're prescribing a antibiotic to pair that with a probiotic. So it's very great um, intervention there. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a multitude of risk factors that can lead to malnutrition. Um, just a few is just a decrease in appetite. Um, that could be to a variety of reasons. Um, of course, again, with our residents that we focus with, their age. Um, just with the aging process alone, we'll see um, decrease in appetite due to just decrease in um, their senses. You know, whether that be the sense of taste, smell, um, any visual deficits, um, it can lead them to not eating as well. Um, any digestive issues, you know, such with GERD or it's, um, other digestive issues that can decrease the absorption of nutrients. Um, oral health is also important um, as you see poor dentition develop. Um, even residents with dentures, they might not have the same chewing ability or biting ability as compared to with their natural teeth. So they might start to avoid certain types of food or just not eat as well. Um, of course, with dysphagia, uh, the ability to swallow is diminished um, and can be problematic and can reduce their intake. Um, some residents who develop dysphagia just become scared to eat because every time they eat, they'll just have that feeling of coughing or choking or something stuck in their throat. Um, any psychological issues can also be detrimental, such as dementia. Um, as they get older, these um, bereavement is an issue. They start to lose people and lose relationships that are close to them. Um, anxiety and depression can also negatively affect their appetite. Um, with polypharmacy, there's greater risk for drug inter interactions and um, side effects. I see this a lot with dietary supplements. A lot of residents will just purchase items over the counter without checking with their physician for any um, drug interactions or making sure there's no interactions with certain foods or nutrients that they need to limit. Just because there's like a huge marketing power out there. Um, so a lot of times they'll end up taking a pill for each individual vitamin or mineral. Um, I had one person who was taking 25 different type of tablets a day, um, just but what was not eating. So they're getting all their nutrients through their pills versus their food. Um, any restrictive diets, um, whether that be just a lot of times of fad diets can be over restrictive. Um, some diets to really restrict an entire food group. Um, so fad diets, you know, they, they're not sustainable. Um, any eating disorders. Sometimes um, diets are restricted just because residents living in our communities um, are, are unlimited or fixed incomes with economic hardship. Um, they might just have uh, challenges with just getting out there and being able to shop and obtain food. Um, any physical limitations, they're unable to prepare food in the home. Simple things like using a can opener or decrease in dexterity so their knife skills are no longer what they used to be. Um, again, other things can be like medical conditions, having infections or sepsis definitely affects how someone's feeling. And when you're not feeling great, you're not going to eat great either. Um, any stroke, Parkinson's, um, other things can be misconceptions. Um, some people have this idea that they can't drink water when they're eating because they feel it would dilute the acid in their stomach and slow digestion. So sometimes they just need more of an education. All right, next slide, please. So we know that malnutrition and malnutrition risk is out there. So when they're coming into our facilities, we wanna make sure that we're identifying them and so we can you know, implement into any interventions and nip that in the bud. A couple of things that are pretty common. First one is um, the mini nutrition assessment and it's put up by Nestle and it is a screening tool. Um, anyone can complete this. 
Um, the second thing that we also have dietitians do is a nutrition focused physical exam. Um, and their guidelines supported by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, or AND, and also in conjunction with the American Society of Entero and Parental Nutrition, or ASPIN. And it's a good to have this set of guidance just for consistency and we're all being um, on the same page and it's not a subjective and we can be more objective with our exams. Next slide, please. So this is the mini nutrition assessment or the MNA. I see a lot of facilities have integrated it into their admissions assessments for residents. And it's something that we can use to rescreen to either quarterly or annually or as needed. Um, it was developed about 20 years ago for adults 65 and older. Um, the full assessment actually has 18 questions, but the mini assessment's been reduced to six questions. Uh, most of the questions pertain to factors that can increase the risk of malnutrition, as we previously discussed, such as changes in intake, um, specifically the decline in intake, any unintentional weight loss, um, any functional declines, psychological stressors, or any acute medical um, issues in the past three months. Um, cognitive deficits, um, including in this one is also BMI or body mass index. And, you know, it, the BMI can be flawed. I know there's discussions about that, you know, where the pros and cons. So BMI is just one um, factor for this assessment. Um, so we do, not, we do not base malnutrition on BMI alone. Okay. So anyone scoring at risk for malnutrition or malnourished should definitely be referred to a registered dietitian for further assessment. Um, dietitians will usually look at medications for any potential side effects or um, we deal with appetite or weight. We'll look at skin issues, any wounds. Um, we'll look at meal intake patterns. You know, some people tend to skip meals or avoid whole food groups, um, any challenges in feeding themselves and looking at anthropometrics as well. Next slide. So our nutrition focused physical exams. Um, so this is different from a regular physical exam that the physician does. Uh, dietitians will focus more on the signs of malnutrition. Again, it's based on the guidelines for AND and ASPEN. Usually a resident will meet the criteria for malnutrition if two or more of characteristics are met. And there's a link there that you can look at a, have a nice table that kind of spells everything out and to follow. Um, it's usually separated by either acute malnutrition or chronic um, malnutrition. Chronic meaning usually pertaining to three months or more. Um, usually with acute malnutrition, we'll see um, factors contributing like infections or sepsis, trauma, or any wounds or burns. Uh, with chronic issues, it's more long-term things like um, ongoing anorexia, um, cognitive issues, um, such as dementia, they just tend to eat less over time, and any self-neglect as well. So in the nutrition-focused physical exam, we'll look at their intake um, and if they're meeting their estimated needs. Um, we'll review any significant weight losses, um, and that's a straightforward calculation. And dietitians are also absorbed for um, loss of subcutaneous fat, um, we'll usually check around the eyes or orbitals, they feel dark, hollowed or depressed. We we'll look at the arms, um, fat around the trunk, chest and rib areas. We'll start to notice any depression between the ribs or if the iliac crest is really exposed. And so there's some, those are some of the signs of body fat loss. We'll also look at muscle loss and muscle is so important for maintaining their mobility and strength. Um, so just looking at the temporal regions, if there's any hollowed or depressed areas, um, looking at their clavicles for protrusions. Do their shoulders look squares? I'll look at their hands for any loss of interosseous muscle. Um, and looking at their legs with their quads and calves for any decrease there. So typically I like to start at the top and work my way down. Um, we'll also observe for any edema. Um, edema is like a factor we definitely have to look at. It can skew what the actual weight may be. And with edema, it can be difficult to observe for any fat and muscle wasting. Um, so usually I'll visually just assess the resident through my interview um, and always ask permission from a resident before touching them or moving a blanket away or clothing aside for the assessment. And if they say no, then that's okay. We can work with what they have. Usually when talking to them, you know, their face and head is usually visible. I can see their hands or I'll just kind of 
walk around and just kind of check on them when they're actually out of bed, either at their meals or working with therapy. Next slide, please. So once we know that they're at risk of malnutrition or we have established a level of malnutrition, whether that being moderate or severe, of course, we wanna do something about it. And with any early interventions, that's key to better outcomes. Um, so of course, we wanna make use of our interdisciplinary team, our physicians. So, um, you know, it's like an orchestra and the physician is like the conductor. So we wanna inform the physician of any nutritional concerns um, that they might not be aware of. It can help with, you know, ordering labs um, and checking for any underlying issues, um, checking for signs of dehydration. Physicians can help with reviewing medications um, and re reducing the pill burden um, with any issues of polypharmacy. Nursing team is great. They're also helpful with recording weights. Um, preferably, this is done in the morning, you know, after voiding, but before meals. And so it's good to be consistent so we get an accurate weight. Um, usually weight inaccuracies are due to human, human error or faulty equipment or just changes in their fluid status. Um, nurses are really good at communicating any changes in intake patterns. If they notice someone usually eats well and all of a sudden they're starting to skip meals, that's important to know. Um, CNAs are a powerhouse in our facility. They're always providing assistance and encouragement with meals. And with our residents, every bite counts. And just having that CNA, just providing that encouragement, it really does make a difference. Uh, therapy teams, um, occupational therapy, they're really great with assessing for any devices that can be supportive with residents maintaining their independence with feeding, um, such as the use of a plate guard or weighted utensils. Um, physical therapy is great with getting residents out of bed and moving. So many times I talk to people and I'm just like, why aren't you eating? And the answer is I'm not hungry because I'm not doing anything. So they're not as active and that can affect their appetite. And of course, speech therapy, dietitians love to work with the speech therapists. Um, and they really great at, you know, evaluating for the appropriateness of the diet textures and consistency and being at the safest level. And once the diet is established, it's okay to make referrals back to ST. Sometimes when a resident first gets evaluated and works with ST, they might be stuck on a pureed diet with honey thickened liquids. But you know, as they acclimate to their new setting, maybe a few months down the line, their strength has improved and they're making gains, maybe they can tolerate a higher consistency. So it's always okay to refer back to speech therapy for that. Um, your activities department, it's a great way to get residents to socialize. People usually eat more when there's other people around to talk and interact with. And any food related activities are always fun and a really great opportunity to provide a variety to their diet. Um, registered dietitians will assess for malnutrition, will document on that and make appropriate referrals and recommendations. Um, oftentimes, if someone's not eating well, it is important to liberalize the diet to the least restrictive and medically appropriate. Um, for example, renal diets are one of the most restrictive diets out there. Um, so if someone who's not eating well, malnourished, could be eating a little bit more, will offer a regular meal before dialysis. And they usually have better intake if, you know, they can have foods that they enjoy that aren't usually offered or are limited with their special diet. Um, usually because when they go out to dialysis, they end up skipping a meal or when they come back, they're usually too tired to eat. And so those nutrients are compensated. Um, I also like to allow um, therapy diets to be weighed for special occasions. So someone who's diabetic and celebrating their 90th birthday and they want to have a cupcake, well, they should be allowed to have that cupcake. We can always modify other portions of carbohydrates for the meals to make adjustments for that. Um, and with any diet liberalization, once they improve, um, acute issues have resolved, they're doing better, we can always re-implement those um, therapeutic diets. Um, dietitians also work with kitchens. It's really important to have a strong dietary manager that works with the residents and the kitchen as well um, to make sure that our menus are meeting the minimum dietary guidelines. Um, and also to see if any special food requests can be accommodated. Of course, we always want to include the residents and their families. Families who visit are great, um, great resource, especially at meals. Um, they can bring outside foods or any of their favorite foods. If you know, their favorite food is a chicken soup, but a facility makes it a certain way, it's not what they remember or how they like it, families can bring that in. Um, we can <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, recommend any um, nutritional supplements for the residents. And oral nutrition supplements are a good way 
to deliver a good amount of nutrition with a low volume. Some residents, you know, they're not feeling well, they're sick, they're eating poorly, they're too weak to chew, but they still take fluids well. Um, and you always want to talk to the residents because if they're not on board with what the plan is, you know, the less successful you'll be and they'll be. Um, we want to review food preferences with them, update the kitchen with any preferences. And I always like to encourage them to at least consume the protein portion of their meals and to drink their beverages um, just to help with their immune function, musculature, skin, and prevent dehydration. And also with um, any fortified foods, um, they have fortified ice cream with additional protein and calories. Um, some places make a super cereal just to boost the nutritional content of it. Um, again, every little bite counts. Okay, um, next slide, please. And of course, there's always challenges. I think the biggest one with across the board is staffing um, in long-term care. Um, and this is going through all departments. Um, so from a dietary perspective, sometimes this limits the kitchen's ability to make special requests and accommodate those special requests. And it can impact um, meal service and dining times. Um, with budgets across all departments, but especially with the food service departments, the cost of commodities have been rising exponentially. Um, but really, meeting residents' nutritional needs, you know, it's, it's low risk, low cost, you know, spending money on those supplements or that special food item and preventing malnutrition and having their infection um, progress into sepsis, it's, it's gonna cost less than a hospitalization or use of IV antibiotics or supplies for wound care or increased labor costs for specialized care. Um, menu variety is another challenge. So you, you menus are usually written to meet the preferences of majority of the residents. So, you know, tray waste should be observed and get feedback from residents and staff for any menu updates and try to do those special things for residents if you can. Um, any preferences for cultural foods and preferences. Um, sometimes state and federal guidelines don't allow for undercooked foods or raw foods, like such as meats. Some people like their steaks rare. Um, here in Hawaii, um, we can't serve in a healthcare sitting, in, setting any raw fish, such as sashimi, sushi or poke, and we can't serve undercooked eggs. Although pasteurized whole eggs are allowed to be cooked um, under. And just overall, um, you know, creating a home-like environment for the residents to be able to eat when they want to um, and not be set with times. And so that can always be challenging. Um, ever since with COVID, isolation precautions for infections, whether that, whether that be with COVID or flu, when residents are isolated, um, they tend not to eat as well. In addition to not feeling well, you know, they, don't, they might not be getting the extra attention and the socialization. So it's always important to work with the infection preventionist, preventionist for the best practices and any updates with that. Um, other challenges, supply chain issues, we've been having inconsistent supply of oral nutritional supplements and even shortages of enteral formulas. Um, not too much uh, and feeding syndrome, lastly. I don't see it too much in long-term care, usually more in the acute care setting. Um, so this is usually with residents with severe malnutrition or periods of starvation. When food and nutrition is reintroduced, it can cause a shift or imbalance in their electrolytes and lead to um, complications with pulmonary and cardiac um, function. So again, usually monitored in the acute care setting, but I have seen it in long-term care settings as well or someone's severely malnourished or two things have been stopped, they've been transitioned to hospice and all of a sudden family or residents might have a change of heart and they have a feeding tube placed. So it's something that definitely has to be monitored. Next slide, please. So, you know, an ounce of cure, uh, so an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. So we wanna be proactive versus reactive. We wanna recognize risk factors for malnutrition and early signs of it, make referrals to it, to the dietitian or any other disciplines as needed. Um, a lot of chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, congestive heart failure, kidney disease can be managed with proper nutrition. Um, you know, sometimes infections like UTIs, pneumonias can happen, but making sure our residents are meeting their nutritional needs gives them a better chance of finding out these infections that can develop into sepsis. Next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> I, I'm not sure if we have um, a handout. There was like a little worksheet that has the, um, oh, tool for, to assess for malnutrition. And this is a basic form to check off whether someone's um, 
malnourished either severely or moderately, factors contributing to that. And it's like a good way to just communicate with the physician for the findings and to add a diagnosis to the resident's chart. Um, other than that, um, just wanted to leave you with some ideas that, you know, optimal nutrition is really important piece of the puzzle. It is a piece of the puzzle for our resident's immune health function, their physical function, and providing them their energy to allow them to do the things they enjoy. Um, quality of life must also always be considered. Food is one of the few things that our residents in nursing homes have control over. They look forward to meals. Um, too tight of controls can have unintentional consequences. Overly restrictive diets can inhibit appetite and their desire to eat. Um, sometimes with too tight of blood sugar controls, it can lead to hypoglycemia and falls. We don't want that. So we try to be liberal with our diets as much as possible. Um, and my last but not least, my favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln when working with um, our residents. In the end, it's not the years in our life. It's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. Thank you so much for joining in today. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I'll, I'll try to adjust them as best as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darcy. What a wonderful presentation. So I, what I got out of that is um, cupcakes are okay. You can have yes. your cupcake. <laughs> you can have your cupcake and eat it too. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and uh, audience, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and, and we can connect you with Darcy. And we did throw in the chat that severity and type of malnutrition identification chart, uh, the link to that chart for those of you that may be interested, feel free to, to pull that out of there. Um, and then also we do have the link for um, the post-presentation evaluation. Uh, as always, we love to hear from you, love your feedback. So if you have a few moments and wouldn't mind taking um, that post-eval, the link is in there. Um, and uh, again, any questions, reach out and, and we can connect with Darcy. As always, thank you everybody. Thank you to our guest speaker and um, join us next week, Wednesday, June 28th. Jesse, Take care. Next week we're actually going to um, be looking at utilizing appreciative inquiry techniques to develop IP education. So we okay. decided we'd kind of like to give them a bit of a taste of what's going to happen next week. So our own um, Julia Drusinski will actually be presenting for us next week. So again, that's utilizing appreciative inquiry techniques to develop IP education. So that will be our last presentation before our break in July. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. Any tools for developing um, resources for IPs is always appreciated. So stay tuned, everyone, for, for that topic for next week. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Take care and be well, and we will see you next time.